Well, good morning once again, <laughs> dear church family. God bless you all. We are going to be in the book of Judges this morning. Doesn't seem like the kind of place in the Bible you'd want to go on a Mother's Day, but I think we'll see that the message kind of fits. I think there's something here. We're going to be in Judges, the 13th chapter. And as you're finding Judges 13, let's just quickly remind ourselves about this uh, time block in Israel's history, the Judges time block. No centralized authority really in Israel. There's no king. There's no, uh, no teaching prophet really. No, no Moses. No Joshua. These guys are gone. And the people are kind of doing whatever they want to do. Whatever seems right in their own eyes. And of course we enter into these endless series of cycles. And uh, Israel blessed and prosper you know, enjoying prosperity and freedom, and they begin to wander in their hearts and minds from God, and God judged them for it, put them under the oppression of her pagan neighbors. Israel would be oppressed and sometimes brutalized to one extent or other. They would cry out and repent, and God would raise up a judge, a special judge, law uh, a deliverer. And as long as that judge was alive, Israel would be doing fine. And then as soon as the judge would die, the whole thing would start over again. You know, and that, that's the time block that we're sort of locked into now in the book of Judges. Now, the last judge that we, we were thinking about together last week was Judge Jephthah. Remember Jephthah? And uh, he's kind of a mix, mixed bag, isn't he? Remember in the olden days, if you're going to watch, let's say you're going to watch a Western from the 1950s or something. You, it's easy to tell who the bad guy is. He has a black hat. <laughs> he probably has a beard too, <laughs> right? And the good guy's clean shaven, he wears a white hat. And he only ever does things that are good and speaks truth. But um, we realize very quickly that uh, life isn't quite like that. Uh, you can have a guy who's generally good who does some pretty stupid things. And you can have a wicked person who time to time may have a momentary flicker of conscience and do something that seems commendable. That's kind of the human condition. It's kind of messy. And Jephthah is a mixed bag. Jephthah, we saw, he was brave, wise. He was intuitive at times. He had a pretty good understanding of Israel's history, it seems. Redemptive history. Uh, and yet he's rash. He's foolish, he's ignorant, and he is not in a right relationship with God's Word. And the results of that relationship, or lack thereof, were absolutely catastrophic. I mean, the guy executed his own daughter. And um, we said, well, we don't want to, I mean, we're probably, we're never going to have to uh, pass through something like that. We're never going to make that kind of mistake the way Jephthah did, are we? Chances are, no. But the lesson still, I think, got through to our hearts. We are not just going to cast God's word behind us and not consult God's word and not see what God has to say on whatever it is we're thinking about, whatever course of action we might be contemplating. We want God's opinion on this because we don't want similar catastrophes in our life. And that was a hard lesson well, after Jephthah, we had a short series of judges, and that puts us now in Judges 13. And we're going to hear about the parents of Samson. Now, everybody's heard of Samson, right? Judge Samson. Pretty impressive guy. Well, I'm happy to announce as we pass through Judges 13, it's actually a pretty nice message. <laughs> I don't think we're going to be deeply convicted or troubled as we leave here today. I don't think we're going to be locking ourselves in our rooms, uh, lapsing into depression or something. <laughs> For once, John is going to teach a, a message that's pretty nice. Okay, so let's look at it. <laughs> Judges 13 and verse 1. And again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Just pause real quick there on that first verse to remind ourselves that the 40-year oppression followed Israel's rebellion. Don't get the order mixed up. These people deserved it once again. I mean, God is being faithful. He said this is what's going to happen. 
God is not being unkind. He's not being unjust. He's not being um, unfair. He is giving these people what he promised they were going to get if they wandered from him. It's just, it's kind of like that hard teaching there in the book of Genesis. Chapter 2, God said, Adam, you eat that fruit, you're going to die. And so chapter 3 rolls around, and what does God have to do? He has to just show Adam, I mean what I say, Adam. You're going to get the message. I, I don't, I'm not like so many of these parents, you see these parents nowadays. It, it drives Lindy bonkers. You're in the store or some, a restaurant or someplace, and the kid is completely acting up, and mom says, now you stop that, or such and such a thing's going to happen. And the kid knows mom and dad are not serious, and they just get worse and worse. They keep on going with this bad behavior. And Lindy says, for heaven's sakes, these parents have to follow through with what they're threatening, you know. Because if you don't, the heart in that child is fully set in them to do evil, right? Or to keep on going. And God says, no, I keep my word for sure. Well, let's see what happened here. Verse 2. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of the angel of God. Very awesome. But I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. Well, we've been introduced to this character before, haven't we? This mysterious supernatural figure, he goes by the title angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. And we've seen this character, even in the book of Judges, he stands and he speaks in God's place. And you'll be reading an account of the angel of the Lord coming to talk to somebody, and the person will speak to the angel of the Lord, speak to the angel of the Lord. Next thing you know, they're speaking to God. The text will say, and they said to the Lord. And you get the idea that this angel of the Lord, who's treated as God's equal, you sort of finally uh, come to the conclusion that this can't be anyone other than the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ himself. This is God the Son. This is the second person of the Trinity. And he is now visiting this woman. I think this is very interesting. At the dawn of human history, a fallen angel came to the woman and told her nothing but lies and plunged the whole human family ultimately into sin and depravity. But here, very ironic that Jesus himself, pre-incarnate, would come to a woman as the angel of the Lord, and he would speak to her truth and life and good things. Uh, he's promising her another supernatural birth, and he knows in a few thousand years, I'm going to come into the world I'm going to have, I will come into the world via a supernatural birth myself. But at this stage, the angel of the Lord has come to the woman to promise her good things. A deliverer is coming, and she will be his mother. A Nazarite, now he, she says, the angel says to the woman, rather, no wine for this, this son of yours, no wine, no similar drink, no unclean things in his diet, you're not going to cut his hair because he is a Nazarite. Now, who remembers reading about Nazarite somewhere else in the Bible? Do you remember Nazarites? I mean, we're getting far enough in the Bible, we can start drawing on things we've already looked at together, can't we? And in Numbers, the sixth chapter, we have some rules prescribing, uh, making prescriptions for Nazarites. And the Nazarite is somebody who is separated in a special way for God's plans and purposes. The Nazarite. Of course, we're all we all should be separated for God's plans and purposes. We all want to glorify God in our lives. But in the Old Testament, there was a special class of servant, and he is called a Nazarite. He is separated for God's special plans, 
No wine for him. He is not to drink wine. Now, why not? Do you remember? You probably, it was a long time ago we talked about this, right? We're going pretty slow. Wine symbolizes joy. If you're having a wedding feast or something, everyone's happy and celebrating, and they break out the wine. Wine is a symbol of joy. And the Nazarite says, no wine for me, thank you. And that will be my little symbolic gesture showing that I am going to forego certain joys in this life so I can do what God's called me to do. Certain things I'm just not going to engage in because I have more important things to do. I have priorities now. I am separated to God in a special way, and I'm willing to forego certain joys. Uh, the Nazarite doesn't cut his hair. Why not? Well, when, when your hair gets a little bit long, which I never really have to worry about, except back here, <laughs> Krusty the Clown look, um, when you cut your hair, when you look in the mirror and you say, I think I'll cut my hair, it's looking a little long, what are you doing? You're sort of taking charge of your own body and life. And you are sort of in autonomous fashion deciding what you're going to look like. Well, the Nazarite, remember, uh, he is separated for God's service. He is 100% sold out to God. So he doesn't cut his hair. And again, it's another little symbolic gesture that his body and his life, he's entrusting that to God. God, you're in charge. And this is my outward symbol to the world, my long hair, that I'm uh, wholly depending on God. He is going to run my life uh, and everything about my life. Uh, you'll also remember from uh, number six that the Nazarite was never to go near a dead body. Don't touch the dead. Don't go near the dead. Why not? Because death is connected with sin. There is death in the world because original man Adam sinned. Death, I mean, it drives me bonkers, guys. <laughs> when you open up some science book somewhere, you open up a textbook, a magazine, any, uh, sometimes in, even in the newspaper, and they'll tell you that a new 80-million-year-old fossil has been discovered. We found a fossil. This is 65 million years old or 85 million years old. And, of course, on this worldview, man is a late arrival on the scene. We've only lately evolved a million years ago, which means... The earth was supersaturated with death for millions and tens of millions of years before man arrived. Well, friends, that can't possibly be the case. It was mankind who brought death into the world via our sin. So the next time someone tells you they found a fossil of something 60 million years old, you can tell them, you found a fossil not 60 million years old. It can't be older than us because we're the problem. In any case, the Nazarite was not to go near dead things because it's connected with sin, and he's set apart from sin to God, see? And of course, this reminds us of Jesus. Was there anyone who was uh, a more spectacular example of a person set aside for God's unique plans and purposes than Jesus? I mean, isn't he the ultimate example of somebody who only did that which was pleasing to God? He was the, he was the ultimate Nazarite, better than any Nazarite that ever came or ever will. Uh, you remember the Nazarite, he was not supposed to drink wine, abstaining from wine. Well, Jesus turned water into wine for the wedding feast at Cana, remember? And I can't find any place in the Bible that says Jesus never, never drank wine. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but he certainly had no problem with breaking out the wine for people to enjoy. But guess what? He set aside the joys of heaven to come to the earth. How about that? The Nazarite says, well, I'm, I'm willing to forego some, some joys in this life to serve God. Jesus left the third heaven. He left that place of, of preeminence and glory. He was sharing glory with the Father. And he condescended to this earth and took a human nature, and he was not born in some palace someplace. He was born in a manger and placed in a feed trough, and it just, you can't imagine a step of condescension like that. You talk about foregoing joys for the plans and purposes of God, you just look at Jesus Christ. And then we kind of ask ourselves, what sacrifices do we make, you know, for God's plans and purposes? I don't know if Jesus ever cut his hair or not. I think he probably did. I mean, we know that 
Jewish men living 2,000 years ago in the Holy Land, they, they cut their hair. We have some artistic depictions of these people. They, I don't see any hippies, <laughs> really, I can't see that. But remember, Judas had to arrange a signal with the, with the temple guard. He said, okay, I'm going to go in the garden over there. Now, the guy that I kissed, now you get him. He didn't say, go find the only white guy with long blonde hair. That's, he'll stand out pretty good, you know. I'm thinking of these old Bibles that used to depict Jesus like that. Jesus probably cut his hair. Nevertheless, um, was there any better example than Jesus of a person who com completely surrendered to God? Jesus said, I only do those things which please my Father. I only say the things he told me to say. And he could point the finger at the Pharisees and say to those guys, he issued the challenge. He laid down the gauntlet. Which of you convicts me of sin? Now let's hear it. And there's only stunned silence from his detractors. You remember the Nazarite? He can't touch a dead. Don't go near the dead. Don't touch the dead. Jesus could walk over to a coffin in the town of Nain. And he could touch that coffin. And the dead child sat up and started speaking. And he delivered that boy to his widowed mom. You know, he, he's not worried about contamination. Why not? Because he's greater than that. You know, I mean, a Nazarite would touch a dead thing and become contaminated, but the Son of God touches something dead and it becomes alive. Aren't you glad? He can touch us. God has made special, mysterious provision for the church age where the holy, sinless, pure, divine Spirit of God himself can dwell in sinful flesh. How does he do it? Mysterious. But aren't you glad such provision's been made? We contend with sin in our flesh, but the Spirit of God is there, striving with us and navigating us in the way we should go. That's amazing. Well, one thing we do know from the Holy Scriptures, from Hebrews in the 7th chapter, 26th verse, even though Jesus touched this world, none of its contaminants stuck to him. In fact, he sanctified everything he touched. And Jesus remains holy and harmless and undefiled and forever separate from sinners. And therefore, he's an appropriate sacrifice to take away our sins, to pay our sin debt in full. So if we were to just synopsize uh, some of what goes on here in chapter 13, the woman, she ran to her, her husband Manoah, and she told him everything that the angel had said to her. She said, this man, he, I th he looked like the angel of God talking to me. And she relayed the whole um, exchange. And look what Manoah does. He's actually a pretty good guy. Look at verse 8. Drop down to verse 8. Then Manoah prayed. Wonderful. R stop right there. This is the best advice I can give anybody. Pray. <laughs> you're, you're confused. You're troubled. You need some help and direction. Pray. Sometimes people ask me complex political questions. What would you do if you were the prime minister? How is he supposed to handle this complex social issue, some other kind of thing? What are we supposed to do with our city and, and whatever? I, I, would tell, I often tell people, oh, I'm not in politics, but if I were, I'd be praying about this in, in more ways than I am now. I mean, first thing, if you're a political leader, first thing you want to do is ask God his opinion on some of this. Well, here a spectacular promise has been made to the woman, and she shared it with the husband, and the first thing he did was pray. Very smart guy. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. Look at that prayer of humility. That's a humble prayer. We need to pray like that. Uh, he is humble. He is willing to obey. Show us what we should do for this child. Teach us. Uh, we're, we are willing to obey. And we, we fully expect that you hear. We have some faith here. You're going to hear this prayer, and you're going to answer. And guess what else? Uh, he is showing great faith. He says, this child will be born. What should we do for this child who will be born? You're going to make good on your promises, God. I like that. He has faith in his heart. You know, I, I, there's a portion of this prayer that kind of sounds like my prayer. Uh, he says, 
O my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again. That sounds like my prayer. I want Jesus to come again. (laughs) Don't you want him to return? I've often prayed it. Lord, come back. Just come back. I really want Jesus to come back. Let the man of God whom you sent come to us again. Well, let's take a look at verse 9. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Then the woman ran in haste and told her husband and said to him, Look, the man who came to me the other day has just now appeared to me. So Manoah arose and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Just stop right there and think about some things. Uh, First of all, we are reminded again that God is transcendent. He is qualitatively uh, infinitely greater than all of us. He is higher than the heavens. He is eternal. He is uncreated. In some ways, uh, unfathomable. We're going to talk about that. He, there are some things about God that are, gonna, that are mysterious and that always will be mysterious. He is infinitely greater than us. But I'll tell you something. He is also imminent. It's not that he's so, just greater than us. It's that he truly wants to be involved in our lives. And he listens to us. He hears our prayers. It tells us here in the ninth verse, and God listened to the voice of Manoah. I like that's a gentle reminder that you can pray to God and he hears you. And things can happen when you pray. And maybe you have a little journal, a little prayer journal, where you can go back and look at things that you've asked for and God has answered sometimes in spectacular ways. Manoah asked, uh, send this man to us again. And um, we're learning a little lesson here in the equality of man and woman because the angel of the Lord came to the woman again. He said, I'll, I'll appear to us. And the angel appeared to her. It's kind of interesting. I think there's something there. I think it's very interesting what the woman says to her husband in verse 10. The woman ran in haste and told her husband and said to him, Look, the man. You, do you, does that sound very similar to something we read in the New Testament? I remember Pilate bringing Jesus out to the crowd, and he said, look, the man. You see, these little, there's nothing extraneous in the Bible. All these little phrases are here for a reason. These are little signposts, little clues. Look, the man. And Manoah asked him, are you the man who spoke to the woman? And he said, I am. That reminds me of John's Gospel as well, chapter 18. Who are you, Jesus of Nazareth? I am. And the whole temple guard hit the the ground. (laughs) We're going to bring on Armageddon right now. (laughs) It it almost seemed like it. And Romans on the ground there. Well, we have a repetition. The woman is, uh, and the man are going to hear from that angel. The angel is going to repeat himself. This son of yours is going to be a Nazarite. You're not going to cut his hair. You're not going to let him drink wine. You're not going to drink wine while you're pregnant because this is a special servant of God that you're carrying. And um, look at verse 15 now because Manoah is very, very impressed with this visitor. Very impressed. Verse 15. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please let us detain you and we will prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, though you detain me, I will not eat your food But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, that when your words come to pass, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Now that's a very interesting exchange. Uh, Manoah and his wife are very affected by this mysterious figure. He is just not... A normal person showing up to them. He is speaking with authority. They know that he is a very special messenger. Sort of reminds me of uh, John the seventh chapter when the Pharisees sent their servants to go snatch Jesus. You go seize him and bring him back here. And of course the servants went and listened to Jesus talk for a couple minutes and then they returned empty-handed. And the Pharisees said, why haven't you brought him? And what was the reply? 
Never a man spake like this man. There's something very special about him. And the Pharisee said, Oh, are you also deceived? <laughs> are you one of his disciples now too? <laughs> something very special about Jesus when he speaks. And Manoah is very impressed about this. He says, Stay with us and, and, and um, have dinner. I've got an animal here, and uh, please stay with us. And the, the angel of the Lord said, Well, I might stay. I might stay and have some fellowship with you, but I'm not going to eat your food. And then he, he says something a little strange, doesn't he? He says, If you're going to offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. Now, why is he talking like that? Well, I think he's talking like that because that seems to be the custom in Israel. Israel has lapsed into a state of total depravity. There's all kinds of uh, pagan worship practice going on. It's su kind of supersaturated the culture again. And so the angel of the Lord has to remind Manoah, if you're going to do this, this is for the Lord's glory, okay? Don't worship and sacrifice to phony, fakey, pagan divinities. That's not allowed. But uh, Manoah wants to know the angel's name. And this is very precious. This is very significant. It's, it's very important. He says, what is your name? Now, Manoah, again, he wants to honor this person who's promised so great things. Uh, he wants to thank God for him. You know, he's thinking, when I pray, I'm going to say, Lord, thank you for who? who? Who is this person? I don't know his name. And when I tell my neighbors about this wonderful thing that, the, that you have promised and it's happened, what can I say to them about you? I can't give them your name. Uh, maybe I want to send you a gift. Maybe, maybe when this wonderful thing happens, I want to thank you with a present. But I don't know who to send it to. You know, you can understand Manoah. He's thinking. So he says, what's your name? And the angel of the Lord says, why do you ask me my name? Seeing it is wonderful. Now, to me, that's case closed. Now we know who this person is. Because you remember Isaiah the prophet, the Christmas prophet? Remember Isaiah, the ninth chapter? Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and he shall be called Wonderful, Wonderful, Secret. It's him, the pre-incarnate Christ. My name is Wonderful. And that's cluing us in onto some things here. It's re reminding us that God is not to be uh, characterized as an old man floating around on a cloud somewhere. You often hear this. I hear atheists talk to me about this all the time. Oh, you believe in some magic man floating on a cloud with a white beard. Absolutely, I do not. Our God is infinite. He's mysterious. He is absolutely frightening. He is higher than the heavens. He is the God who inhabits eternity. He is transcendent and yet eminent. And there are some things about him we just will never figure out. And in our Sunday evening course, we looked at the Song of Solomon, the second chapter. Who remembers that? Chapter 2 of the Song of Solomon, verse 9. The bridegroom, we take that to be Jesus. The bridegroom, we see him in the window. Now he's hidden behind our wall. Now we see him through the lattice. In context, the bridegroom is being playful with the bride. He's outside. He's peeking through the windows. Now he's hidden behind the wall. Now we see him in the lattice. We see him behind the lattice. Got to get close to the lattice to kind of look through and see him. We think the idea there is when he's hidden behind the wall, that is uh, God's symbolic way of saying there are some things about God you'll never find out because you're finite. Those things are for, forever hidden behind our wall. But thank God for his Bible that tells us very clearly some things about Jesus. It's like when you read the scriptures, you see Jesus standing in the window. You're looking at his beautiful face right there. As you read John 8.58, when Jesus says, I am, before Abraham was, I am. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And when Paul says, With, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That's Jesus in the window in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. And sometimes his 
gleams of divinity are thinly veiled. It's like he's standing behind the lattice. And you read a verse passage that speaks of his divinity, and you might miss it the first time. Go back and read that again. Wow! I think this is telling me that Jesus is God. You know? Very interesting. God's word is so beautiful. Well, look at verse 19 now. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it upon a rock to the Lord, and he did a one, he, now he, that's God now, that's the angel. He did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew that it was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have told us such things as these at this time. I'll just stop right there. I, I really think it's, it's, it's a little bit comical, actually, <laughs> that Manoah is in an absolute panic. We're dead. We're going to die. Uh, he has kind of that attitude that Jacob had. Jacob wrestled with the angel, and he said, I've seen God face to face, and yet I'm alive. But Manoah is a little more panicked than Jacob. <laughs> he said, that's it. We're dead. <laughs> and his wife has to kind of be the voice of reason here. <laughs> In other words, calm down, dear husband, calm down. <laughs> if God wanted to kill us, we'd be dead already. He really wouldn't have promised all these great things. Would he? <laughs> Would he have shown us all this? Would he have accepted the sacrifice? I mean, just take it easy. <laughs> but what I think is very significant here, and we're going to end on this thought here. This is the thing that we want to leave here with, okay? Manoah, he's not a priest. Uh, he's from the tribe of Dan. He's not a priest. And he's not offering a burnt offering at the tabernacle either. And yet, it's accepted by God. Now, why is that? Why would it be that God would accept this burnt offering even when it's not being done as God had prescribed through the law of Moses? And this is very significant. You remember uh, Aaron's two sons? You remember that? They tried to offer strange fire to the Lord. And what happened to those two guys? Leviticus 10, dead. Don't you dare, says God. And yet here... We have a man offering a burnt offering to God, and it's accepted. No problem. And he's not a priest, and it's not done at the tabernacle. The reason why it's being accepted is because the Lord Jesus Christ is right there present, and he has sanctioned the whole affair. In fact, it's his idea. He put the bug in Manoah's ear, didn't he? I'm not going to have dinner with you, but if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. And Manoah gets the idea. I think, I, I think I'm... I think he's sanctioning me to offer a thing right here. And he did it. And it was accepted. Friends, this is a major theme in the Bible. A major, major theme in the Bible. We can't ever let it drift from our minds or our hearts. Jesus Christ the Lord is the authority. He is greater than the temple. He is greater than whatever religious institution he has put into place. He is greater than the Sabbath. In fact, Jesus said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath also. And what he sanctions is fine. Major theme in the Bible, especially in the Gospels, in the book of Acts, and in the book of Hebrews. God is not localized, you see, in, in the sense that he can't operate anywhere else. And in fact, Stephen would stand up in his great speech in Acts, the seventh chapter, and he would, he would remind the religious leaders, hey, you guys, our heritage goes back to Abraham. And where was it that God ministered to that guy anyways? Ur of the Chaldees, not here in Jerusalem, way over there in pagan Mesopotamia. And he was with our fathers in Egypt too. And he did plagues and signs and wonders, miracles. God is not localized to this temple, says Stephen. And the young man Saul heard that message and he communicated almost the exact same message to the pagans in Athens. A gentle reminder. I mean, this is nothing new. Solomon, who built the house, 
had a prayer. Remember that? Second Chronicles, seventh chapter, sixth chapter, sorry. But will God indeed dwell with men on the earth? A and that's the question Solomon had. Answer is yes, he will. There is a new heaven and earth coming, and the tabernacle of God will be with men. But he says, Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, God, how much less this temple that I've built. Major theme in the Bible. Jesus Christ, on his own authority, could come into the world 2,000 years ago, right into, right into Israel, right into Jerusalem. He could look at that temple, the very God-ordained, heart, soul, center of the whole program, and he could say on his own authority, you can get around that now. You come straight to me. I will forgive your sins. I can do it. One greater than the temple is here. One greater than Solomon is here. One greater than Jonah is here. It's me. He could do that on his own authority. And here he is, pre-incarnate, in dialogue with Manoah and his wife, and he could say, offer a burnt offering, and I'll accept that. We'll get right around the tabernacle, no problem, because I have the authority around here. I'm the boss. And aren't you glad that our boss is also our best friend, our best friend in the world. He is not far from us. That's the great message of Psalm 145. The Lord is nigh to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. And that's the answer to people who say, what about people who never heard about Jesus living in the jungle somewhere? You know what? They've heard about God they can see his fingerprint on the created order. They know his moral law written on their hearts. And if they will call upon him in truth, he is not far. And they will get what they need to be saved. I'm fully convinced of it. But you and I know now, in the light of New Testament revelation, that Christ is now, in fact always has been, the very center of the center of God's religious program. He is the only mediator between God and men and for those who put their love and trust in him, they are complete. You are complete in him. Nothing lacking, nothing wanting, and he is able to keep you faultless. He's able to present you faultless, keep you from falling, all the way to the shores of that beautiful place called the new heavens and the new earth. He's promised, he's made those promises, you know, and he will make good on those promises. So I thought that was a nice message for us to think about on this Mother's Day and how about we seal them into our hearts with a word of prayer here, okay? Father, in Jesus' precious name, we thank you this morning for the beautiful weather. We thank you for the comfort and freedom we enjoy. We thank you for your precious book, the Bible, and uh, for this uh, beautiful, mysterious, and even a little bit comical uh, exchange here that we got to think about this morning, dear Lord. Uh, Father, as we think about the judges, may our minds move from them to Jesus Christ, the one to whom has been committed all judgment. We love our Savior. Help us, God, in our hearts to love him more and more each day, moment by moment. Help us to be surrendered to him, the good shepherd, the great shepherd, who laid his life down for the sheep. So, Lord, hear our prayers. Make them acceptable today, please, in your beloved one, for the good of your people and for your glory on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, and God bless you all.